Okay. Tracy, you about ready? I am ready, Andrew. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Um, it's uh, it's really good to see you. Uh, so you. to everybody who has um, has joined, um, Tracy um, Tracy Weimer is almost like m more consistently than most humans, like one of the most interesting people I, I get to talk to. And he spent a lot of time in workplace strategy and design at Knoll. Um, and I'll, I'll let him say hi in just a quick second. But when we started talking about bringing employees back to work safely, um, Tracy just had some really interesting insights and perspectives um, from what he's seen in corporate. And we thought that it'd be really a good idea to have some of that conversation live. So um, Tracy, if you wanna say a quick hello, that'd be great. Hi, hi. hello everyone. And uh, glad to be here. And first and foremost, hope everyone's uh, safe healthy and uh, taking care of themselves and their loved ones. So, um, so to everyone who's just joined, if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to toss them in the Q and A during the discussion. Um, but, uh, we will also set aside time at the end of, uh, at the end of the conversation specifically for questions. Um, so it's about 20 minutes to discuss and then about 10 to, to take questions. Um, but I will try to pull stuff in as we go. So, um, I guess welcome back to all those who were there, who were here last week. Um, Tracy, when we last spoke, um, you described bringing people back to work safely as sort of the ultimate design problem or design challenge. What did you mean by that? And like, what are some practical sort of examples of, of what changes? Well, I think so much of it is multifaceted in the fact that, um, you know, many times the design challenge is, you know, you know, small set of criteria, you know, meet the needs of that criteria, move it forward. Um, here, we are working on so many different levels. Um, I, you know, I, I think we're working at a very, you know, on the emotional state. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know if we're going through the actual phases. I'm not sure if there are phases to trauma, but I think culturally, um, we're going through this trauma. And we began with this emotional state. Um, we've gotten very pragmatic. Um, but I think there's also this moment now for, for it to be very aspirational and to say, okay, what, what, you know, can we improve on what the, the physical space provides? Can we really think about humanity as it comes into the office? And can we create a greater sense of comfort uh, for people to come into this place? So I think when I look at it as a, this incredible design challenge, it was balancing those needs from an emotional state for people, but also those pragmatic requirements uh, that obviously something like this is put upon us uh, just to keep everybody safe or, and uh, calm yeah. as they re-enter re the workplace. And you're, and you're thinking through this in your position at Knoll. Can you quickly describe uh, what that position is and kind of how you're, like the lens through which you're looking at the problem? Absolutely. I'm Vice President of Workplace at Knoll and uh, I run our strategy team. I uh, spend time with uh, Kylie Roth who directs our research at Knoll uh, and I'm, uh, I'm part of our product development team as well. So it's trying to take all those different facets and bring it together uh, in a cohesive manner that makes sense for us from, a, uh, from something that we can consider, uh, brief, manufacture and bring to market uh, that hopefully will Im improve the experiences people have in their their offices and homes yeah so um so you i, I want to um maybe start practically and then maybe we can like move up to some of the broader themes um, um you mentioned like signage like mm -hmm. where do you go um mm -hmm. how many people are allowed into an elevator what are some of the things you've talked to a lot of your your customers? I think that you've had a lot of like roundtable discussions with other um, many of your peers. What are some of the practical things that you expect to change inside the office, um, mm -hmm. especially the good ideas, or or maybe even the bad yeah. ideas too? We'd love to hear the bad ideas yeah. as well. Yeah, I think there's some some odd ones out there that we can <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, I think from a very practical standpoint, I mean, you know. You know, we look at circulation and, and, and interestingly enough, I think whenever we look at workplace planning, we're always looking at circulation. Um, so the uh, more generous uh, corridors, more genera generous circulation corridors. So a uh, double loaded corridor where you're trying to get uh, two lanes of traffic uh, through a narrow space uh, just doesn't maybe make sense that much. Uh, are there paths of circulation? Uh, um, 
that could possibly just help uh, with traffic flow. And um, when you say circulation, you mean people physically moving through the space? People not... physically moving through the space, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And the whole notion you know, that is a, a big concern for companies right now is simply transit. How do people get to the office? Mm. Um, um, if you look at it from a suburban model, people can go from their home to their car to the parking structure, but then what happens? How do they get up? How do they get up into the building? Uh, or will the building be doing temperature checks as they you know, sequence into the building? Um, and this sequencing is, is kind of an interesting uh, kind of descriptive of how people are planning to return to the office. So there's going to be a sequence to the return. And there's going to be a sequence to the flow of people in the building as well. Can you give me so an example? Like, can you give me an example of um, ballpark headcount? Like, how do you deal with, is it like, are you talking about high rises and getting you know, 15,000 people up to the, the top half of the Salesforce tower? Like what, what do you mean by sequence? Right, well, yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, it's, it's I, I think the, um, the, the symbol that everybody's been using is like, okay, this can work from the suburban model, but from an urban model, it, you, people have put up the Empire State Building, so it has its own zip code. How do you get all those people up? You know, how do you get them up? Now, let's also put it in context of what people's plan, plans are for returning employees. Um, they're using a, this kind of metaphor of, of a series of waves. And that first wave may be a very low percentage. So you have that working for you. But there's still going to be a sequencing. If you're, only, you know, to, if you're practicing social distancing and you're only having a couple people go up the elevator, that could take a long time. Um, so they're also doing shifts. You know, the notion of A and B teams or mm -hmm. potential project team for this period of time. You know, they stay at home for the, the following month and the next project team comes in. So there's all this thinking about sequencing and logistics, so almost like a large logistic exercise as well as a practical exercise about just how people are perceived as being safe in the workplaces. Who, who do you think is like an expert in this right now? Like if you were to say like there's a person or a team or a company, who's really good at this? You know, I think every company is doing the best they can. Um, I, I, one of the things we, we've been trying to err on is the side of science. And, and try not to be too overreactionary and say, let's always re defer to the science. So we go to the CDC, OSHA's putting out some good things that are just providing guidelines. Um, so we're hoping, uh, like everybody was an expert overnight, it seemed. <laughs> then mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, uh, then it's come, come back to, let's really just focus on the science and what the science tells us. And then, you know, once again, as we go through, as I said, these kind of phases of, of trauma, how can we think about it more aspirationally as we move forward uh, to the future? Yeah, um, I want to get to the aspiration, um, uh, but I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people that are over the last eleven years. The concept of workplace experience has become a more um, more regularly talked about title, function, and role inside of organizations and no longer just the purview of, you know, the Genslers and architects and um, mm -hmm. sort of outside consultants that come in and sort of temporarily tell you what, you know, you, you might want to consider doing. Is, like, do those who are in workplace experience need to pivot to workplace safety? Um, like, how, it, what is sort of like the future of, call it the next 12 months, is safety yeah. kind of everything or is safety just a component of, of what we've been doing, you know, in the past? I, I think it's more of a, 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 a consideration of logic and common sense. And as we look at it, it's uh, healthy, but not sterile. Um, you know, we were on a call earlier. It's, um, you know, we're not going into, we're not conducting surgery on a daily basis you know, in our offices. So, you know, that degree of, of, of consideration doesn't need to be put into play. So the whole notion of us creating a more comfortable and healthy workspace, I think is completely valid. And you know, those consider, considerations need to be taken in. As, and I think the workplace experience people are the ones that you know, become the clearinghouse for all this thinking. They bring all this together and, and think, oh, okay, you know, we have to get people in. Oh, we have to make sure they're safe. We may have to be providing PPE for, to your point, that 12 to 18 month period. Um, and how do we provide that? What's our sourcing for that? Um, what's our protocols for, um, you know, a micro kitchen or a mini break room? Uh, what, what is our protocol about, you know, uh, uh, 
China and silverware and those types of things. Are we for it or against it? What are, you know, are we going to just implement good washing, washing techniques for this? Or are we going to go to disposable? So all these things are being considered, uh, I think, in the greater scheme of a holistic workplace experience. Um, I was talking to one uh, customer. They, have, they operate in 60 countries, 87,000 employees, 60,000 of which are now working from home. And um, they made a really interesting observation. They said, you know, right now at a federal and regional level, we're having conversations about overreaction is the only reaction. You must overreact. Um, however, I'm sorry, Andrew, is that overreact just to instill a sense of safety or perception of safety with their employee base? Uh, well, at a, so like countries and states are, are talking about this concept of like the only reaction is an overreaction. We should have more PPE. We should have more mm. hospital beds. We should have an excess of things. Mm. Um, we should have an excess of capital support, you know, when you see with, uh, when you see with, uh, you know, the CARES Act and so forth. But mm -hmm. he said with us and inside corporate and workplace, um, there's actually a danger in overreacting. Um, and he said, the danger is um, if we create all these stringent rules around what you can and can't do, 60,000 people, like if you do everything all at once, people are going to start ignoring the things that are on yes. the bottom of the list. Yes. And as soon as they start ignoring a few things, they'll start ignoring the things that actually really matter. And so we're in this weird position where we have to strike a, a level headed balance and can't be overly restrictive on, mm -hmm. on policy or methods. And I guess, I guess that's, um, I guess that's my question is like, is that the difference between sterile and um, how did you put it? Uh, sterile and sort of like healthy, yeah, healthy, healthy, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it, you know, there's, there's such a personal responsibility here. I mean, I think all of us have experienced this. Um, we weren't, you know, as, as much as the term was bantered about, we weren't locked down. We were asked basically to stay home and shelter in place. So it was really, once again, dependent on the individuals, how they chose, chose to interpret that. Um, we were asked to maintain six foot distances in, in public spaces, even if we were like in the park, walking our dogs, climbing a hill or whatever it was. Some people choose to you know, honor that and some people choose not to. Um, you know, an example we just heard the other day, the company brought their folks back to work, they had six foot distancing in place, they had a real small return, uh, but lo and behold, there were four people sitting at the same table in the lunchroom. So mm -hmm. all the things they've done is, is uh, kind of went out the window. But it does come down to personal responsibility at a certain point in time. The enterprise can do so much. They can put the right structures and parameters in place. And they can put in the health police, which we've heard a lot about. You know, hey, you know, you, you guys may be sitting too close. Hey, make sure you wash that, or those types of things. But at the end of the day, it's personal responsibility that's going to really uh, determine the, the efficacy of all this. So um, one of the questions that came in is um, around open office. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see it changing? Um, how do you see it remaining the same? And th there is this sort of fun debate around like shared space. I've, yes. I've heard both sides. It's like shared space yes. is going away and I've heard shared space is the answer. Um, what's your perspective? And my perspective is the open office is gonna to shift to more, you know, can it, well, let me back up. I think we went too far. I think the densities, you know, the real estate was really working for the real estate people and, and the real estate arms of companies. Uh, was it working as well for the people? You know, so I, that's just a question. So I think there's an, an opportunity to balance that and say, how do we people become more the center of the thinking about how an open office works? Mm -hmm. um, people we're looking first. at people first. We're looking at terms like, you know, can an office become a place that is restorative? Can it become a sanctuary? Can we, you know, and I think this is an incredible opportunity for, for the design teams that are out there as to rethink how an office may go from a highly efficient space to maybe a more restorative space um, and what the opportunities uh, that provides them. Uh, in planning the new office. Can you, can, you, can you give me some practical examples? Like what happens? Cubicles, plexiglass, I've heard plexiglass sales are up. Yeah, plexiglass is up. You know, I, I think once again, that's part and parcel of the reactionary. I, I don't think a, a solution for the future is to always just go to the past. I, I you know, we at Knoll are, are kind of, you know, yes, we have some, in, if people have uh, a panel-based system and they need to modify that, we can do that so easily. 
Uh, but, but for those folks that are thinking a little bit differently about their workplace and they want a different solution, we're thinking about that, about what that could be uh, and how that could be, once again, this, this almost restorative sanctuary type place that speaks about comfort and is a healthy place to be uh, with not necessarily being a, a sterile place to be. And we still feel design matters in all this. Sure. Um, do you, uh, okay, I have, I have like so many questions. Um, um, keep going. <laughs> are capital projects, new capital projects dead? Like, do you think that there's like new builds are essentially on pause? Um, some, you know, and once again, we've been talking to people you know, literally around the globe. So uh, in some instances, you know, those are, some people are taking a, a pause. Uh, some companies are, are trying not to be overly reactive and, and they're taking a pause and saying, okay, let's see how the dust settles and how this uh, uh, flushes out. Um, San Jose just yesterday announced that uh, they're going to um, begin construction, allow construction to, to, re, uh, to restart May 4th. Um, so some of the wheels of commerce are starting to slowly grind back into action. Um, so we're going to see those bounce back. Yeah. Um, but, there, but there's a difference between policy and like what's allowed and then what people and corporates actually do. Mm. You know, saying like, we're going to allow for construction to um, happen again. You know, mm -hmm. that's great. But like, will corporates, is anyone really touring 500,000 square feet of new space? You know, is anyone really looking at building out a million square feet of space? Or are they... Um, I mean, there are companies that are, quite frankly, and when, when this hit, they were in the throes of doing just that. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it's almost like the question, the question is, are we not going to invest in our people? Uh, you know, so, I mean, if you, if you don't put the capital behind the real estate, then there's not the investment in your people to occupy that, you know, so it's kind of a, one of, one of both, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think like I'm excited about the fact that like some organizations are thinking about building, but I, it, it really feels like there's so much uncertainty. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that I think you, you comment, commented on was like, look, this is a two-sided problem. You've got, are you able to make it safe? Are you able to, to make the space safe for people to come back? And then do people believe you? And in the event that you fail either of those things, you sort of fail in your policy. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I guess like perception seems to be a very important part of this. And, and you said, Huge. you know, it's, it's not just safety that people are worried about, it's the solvency of your business. Yes. Um, can you maybe elaborate or reiterate um, yeah. your, your point on that? Well, you know, it, it you know, there, there's kind of that emotional concern about, okay, is my company doing something that I feel is in my best interest from a perception of safety? And granted, you know, as, as I, I, I say on, on any, any conversation I'm having, I'm not an infectious disease expert. And, and, uh, and, and so what we can do is just take the science, interpret the science as best as possible and make recommendations as to what you know, will provide some logical um, safeguards around it. But at the end of the day, if somebody's taking a bus or a subway or, or some other form of mass transit to the office, you know, you're already going to be exposed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so the, the role of the company kind of goes so far, they can kind of take care of the, the bubble once the people enter the bubble, but there's no safeguards about how they get inside that bubble. Um, so that becomes, you know, if you will, kind of narrows the purview and says, okay, let's take care of this. Let's make sure that people are feeling safe about that. And let's make sure when they come into the office that there's a you know, traffic flow, there's occupancy for rooms that has been reduced. There's you know, occupancy for washrooms that have been reduced. All these types of things that just make it easy for uh, people to have that sense of safety as they come into the, to the office space. Right. And, th and that those things need to be communicated. You need to invest just as much in the communication of those things. Absolutely as you do in the actual things themselves. Yes, I, I think there's so much energy right now in those communication platforms about how we're communicating out to organizations. I mean, uh, e even, you know, we've been ho hosting corporate roundtables since the beginning of April. You know, one technically began with a specific client on a Sunday, <laughs> early in April. Um, and what we've done is just taken that and say, okay, now can, at least can we provide companies a checklist? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And it's more you know, pragmatic, you know, as we talked about the very practical things, but it's also, will that drive um, some of the thinking regarding a communication plan? Because communication has to be, uh, you can't over communicate at this point. Yeah. And so, uh, so like, 
dovetailing that, it's not just communication about safety. It's also communication about the solvency of the business. Like, Absolutely. is there a business to come back to? Yes. Um, and, and I think the notion of financial reporting and, you know, the, you know, exactly all those pragmatic things about saying, this is, this is what we're doing. This is the cash, re cash reserves we have. This is our position from a financial standpoint. And also, this is why you've been doing a great job working from home. It's helped keep, if you will, the wheels on the bus you know, spinning. And we are doing everything we can do to make sure that those wheels are continued when we get back into the office mm -hmm. because we need our business back up and running. And when you, the people, the employees, are the vital part of, of that operation. Um, so there's a question that came, came through about the, uh, the material of furniture that Noel is considering. Mm -hmm. Are you going full copper? Like, are you going to be like <laughs> all... Just copper? Like, what's copper. your plan? Well, you know, I'm a big fan of the De Young Museum. I think that copper facade is just gorgeous. I've always been a kind of a copper fan. As a matter of fact, I had an old uh, um, classic sailboat that the bottom was painted in this copper paint, but I digress a little bit. Um, no, we're, we're not going full copper, but what it has done is leverage all of our different business units and saying, oh, hey, textiles, hey, healthcare, we already have done all these, you know, antimicrobial textiles, bleach cleanable surfaces, all those types of things. So it's putting those into play and just spreading the aware awareness about that. You talk about communication, it's communication from organizations like that, us that we've upped our communication just to make sure that everybody's aware of what's available to them. Sure. Um, what happens if people don't go back? Like what happens if they're so productive at home that they can now make the case. Uh, you made this, this, you had this comment before we started the interview, which is like, this is, and perhaps this gets into your, your sort of perspective on innovation. There's this, COVID-19 is like an amazing catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when managers who are once like, you have to be butts in seats, is now saying they actually are very productive from home. I'm willing to like allow this to continue. Are, are furniture companies going to begin to support work from home as like a part of the office, as an extension of the office? Like, are you thinking about, you know, what the workstation of home of like your home looks like? Um, or are you assuming that the vast majority of people will come back to the office? Right. It, it, let me unpack that a little bit, Andrew, because there's a lot, a lot to that question. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to begin, begin with the work from home. I think, you know, you know call it brilliance uh, uh, on our CEO's part. Uh, roughly a year ago, we acquired a company called Foley out in, up in Portland, uh, Oregon. And their whole business is, you know, it's an e-channel, you know, direct to consumer and, and small businesses. Um, so their business is booming right now because so many people, to your point, you know, at the very end of it, I want a good chair. I want a good ergonomic chair that I can sit in. Um, hey, if you can add a height adjustable desk, good. That's good. That's good to do. Um, the, the other aspect of that is, there have been some really great success stories about people working from home. Productivity is pretty good, that type of thing, for certain subsets of the organization. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also some false numbers. You know, people may be working an additional three hours a day. Um, there, there may be some specific job categories that aren't really that conducive to working from home over the long term. I guess there was a, a recent article about Zoom gloom you know, setting in and the fact that from a human dynamic standpoint, we actually need to be together. There's a, at our core, we're human, we're, we're social beings. And so that whole notion of, is this social? You know, you and I on, on, on two rectangles on a screen? Oh yeah, well, I know you, I've known you for a long time, so we can, we can banter, but at the end of the day, I think we have much more fun when we're in the same space. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's something to be said for paintball and you know other things that you can only do in person. <laughs> exactly. uh, so who comes back first? Like you've got these waves. Like who comes back first? Well, th there's been a lot of discussion, and once again, this is going to vary um, uh, company to company. And I, you know, I think this is where a company culture, once again, um, you know, takes precedent. I mean, uh, to totally. I totally get that. I would love Tracy's opinion. Tracy is God for a day. Like who comes back first? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, you know, I put it in the context, who wants to come back first? You know, I think there's a lot of people, claim, you know, that are, are chomping at the bit to come back and others um, that are saying, mm, I'm not as comfortable uh, at this point in time. And I think there's a, a, a portion of the community that may be you know, 
immunocompromised or an at-risk group or those types of things that we have to encourage them and say, hey, you're, it's completely cool you're working from home. That's good, and we've, we're going to support that. I do think this has been just, you know, going back to the whole remote work, this has just been a, a, a moonshot for work, you know, remote work strategies. Uh, and I think you hit on a, a, what historically was a hurdle to really embracing them. And this is like 20, 30 years, and you know, the workplace strategists have been discussing this. And always the hurdle was that mid-management level that said, oh, I needed to see my person in the office. I needed to see the butt, the butt in the seat, as you say. Uh, even though that butt in the seat may be like, you know, on Facebook and, you know, Instagram and all those other things. So I think this has been an incredible moonshot for remote work strategies that companies have had it in place and had, were, were running into obstacles to launch it. All of a sudden those obstacles have gone away. Mm -hmm. Companies that have been kind of just thinking about it, now they can really, you know, solidify those plans and move forward with it. And companies that hadn't even considered it, I mean, we have, uh, you know, a company we know that was not a work from home culture that came from the CEO. Um, all of a sudden they're realizing probably 10 to 15% of their population is going to stay from work from home moving forward. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, uh, what does that do to real estate? Do you think that like, you know, these organizations say, okay, 50% are going to stay work from home. You're super productive. It's no longer the perception of productivity. We're going to get rid of some of our office space. Um, well, we've had those conversations. As a matter of fact, I was uh, with some, uh, some folks yesterday with the Chamber of Commerce in Silicon Valley. Uh, and obviously the concern from the real estate community is, you know, the, all, they, all they keep hearing is shrink, shrink, shrink. But they have to understand, if the planning is different, if you're putting 50% of the occupancy in, in meeting rooms, if you're providing a more comfortable, more restorative space, uh, so um, you're going to be using more space. So we're looking at, quite frankly, at the real estate portfolios maintaining uh, their current footprint, but the utilization is just different. Right. And, and I think what it calls in play is how hard and fast companies stuck to metrics as being a deciding measure of whether real estate is successful or not. Um, I, you know, I would counter is uh, your employees' well-being a deciding factor in how well your real estate is working or not. Well, I think that that's your point about, is it real estate first or people first? Um, mm -hmm. You know, Georgia just reopened. Yes. The reason given for Georgia reopening is because they're going to have a massive deficit. They just like don't have the tax revenue that they were expecting and they, they feel they absolutely need to reopen. Now there's all these other things around making sure that people have income and, you know, you stop with the jobless claims and uh, mm -hmm. all of these other things that need to happen. But I think um, that feels like a dollars sort of, equation and yes. perhaps less of public safety uh, equation. Um, I'm also extremely privileged to be able to do my work from a distance. And I think you are too, um, without having to physically go to a space. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely come from a, a place of bias. Um, can, I, can I pick up on that a little bit, Andrew? Yeah. Because uh, our CEO, Andrew Kogan, you know, hit on this early on and uh, he was, he's been great about outreaching uh, to the associates at Noel. that there's a dichotomy of work, as he put it, uh, occurring. And you just touched on it. Um, there are those like you and you and you and I who it, it is a privilege. We can perform. We can work from uh, uh, from home, and we can work remotely. Um, there are others. Um, you know, we look at people in the restaurant industry, the food production uh, industry, the people that are in the, obviously the frontline workers in the healthcare industry. Uh, there is a whole you know population that doesn't have that luxury, that doesn't have that privilege. So how are we thinking about them? How are we making sure that they're, uh, they're being cared for and our considerations are, are with them as well? So we, we've, we've passed the, the 30 mark. Um, oh, how sorry. are you, no, quick. no, you're, you're great. Uh, how are you on time? Is it okay if we I'm go good. for a little while longer? Yeah, I'm good, we're good. All right, so for the folks that have to go to 1030s, at least Pacific, obviously feel free to drop. <laughs> Nobody's holding you here, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the event that you want to stick around, we're going to keep going for another 10 minutes at the very least. Um, okay, so um, there was one organization we were talking to who said it was taking 12 months to get DocuSign approved mm -hmm. as like an internal technology that they could use. Um, it got approved in 48 hours when there it came go. back up. Is this what you mean by what do we want 
to mm-hmm. change? What are sort of the things that we can use this as a catalyzing event? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm going to look at it from our standpoint as well. I, you know, in full disclosure, and we have a product development process, a new product development or a custom product development process that, you know, has stop gaps, has goes, no goes along the way. Um, you know, we did some solutions for a, a major tech company in, in the same time frame, like 48 hours. Um, so the turnaround, I think the, 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 and now granted, right now we're kind of working on this adrenaline, right? We've got this adrenaline going, and we it's maybe a, a, a pace we can't maintain. But I think the lessons learned from that about you know can we cut through some of this? You know, can we cut through some of the some of the layers that have historically maybe stopped some innovation in the past and streamline those processes so we can get to a better solution faster? Mm-hmm. Um, so everyone's got this like you know, the, the, the BYOD, bring your own device uh, yep. movement over the last, uh, call it seven to 10 years. Yes. Um, well, now like you're going home, you know, it's, it, you know, you're not even bringing your own device. You're just keeping your own device sort of in the same place as you wake up and working from your pajamas. Are, are you going to mm-hmm. be like dis- distributing, like, is it now incumbent on companies to like pay for the internet that you have at home? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't even gone there. That's a that's a good question. That, that, that's beyond my pay grade, Andrew. I, I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can go there. Um, How, well, maybe. maybe I, but maybe but, the, but I think the okay. whole the whole notion of a, a you know a go bag. You know, is there like a corporate go bag that the companies provide their employees? You know, I think we could really make some cool spinny back leather ones for companies. That, you know, would be really great. That you know you, you could. You know, put your devices in, put your you know, dongles and cords in, uh, you know, whatever else you're carrying with you that day, and boom, go, you know, that's what you transit with. Um, now, a lot of people do that already you know, in their backpacks or their messenger bags and that type of thing, um, but it'll take on a different perception moving forward. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to wrap in just a couple minutes. I want to get through some of these uh, questions that came up. We're going to do rapid fire, so I'm going to ask them and maybe just give yeah. me kind of off the top of your head. Um, uh, for the percentage of a company that is allowed to work from home um and this is kind of dovetails with my question about the technology or the, the wi-fi like does the company now need to have responsibility in providing furniture or providing some type of assets i'm just going to say what i've heard because once again i'm not an expert on on that i i think you know when uh, a municipality says we're you have to shelter in place that's one thing when a company says you're working from home there's tax implications to that uh, mm. is that a taxable benefit um are there health and safety concerns that get, start getting factored in? So I think it, it, it's not as simple as it sounds, uh, as always with these issues. Um, so, you know, okay. company by company. Are there good guidelines on how to deal with shared works, workplaces, hoteling? Um, like what's the, what's the industry best practice right now? Specifically uh, around bringing employees back to, to the office safely. Yeah, you know, there, there's, there's actually been some, some cool things. Like, uh, you know, one company we know that you know, was a pioneer in hoteling. Um, they're, realize, they're realizing a shared space now is, is, is shared by one individual for the whole day, and they're indicating, they're marking if that space is being occupied. Mm. And so at the end of the day, it gets cleaned and that mark gets removed. You know, so there's interesting things like that. Um, there's a lot of clean desk policies coming into play. Um, but I think, once again, communication is not only um, verbal, uh, but it's also visual. You know, the whole notion of visual cues in the, in the office and mm-hmm. also wayfinding and those types of things come into play. Are you going to cap headcount per floor, per building? Are you going to measure uh, headcount? Yeah. You know, I, I think that is going to really kind of be in the corporate you know, planning sector as it looks at you know, the occupancy of a floor. If they've in a, you know, implemented some you know, what we feel are thoughtful measures from a comfort and health planning standpoint, um, then that's going to determine what the uh, what the occupancy would be for the floor. Another one is uh, snacks, coffee, um, high touch points, shared spaces like fridges and microwaves. Yeah. Um, uh, any uh, big thing, this, yeah, the social spaces are those pinch points. Um, some companies we know are you know, you know, scuttling, if you will, their their food service operations. Other ones are are just doing grab and you know, grab and go. Uh, you know. Beretta, it's a restaurant on Valencia Street. I think they have it really down. I mean, there's so many lessons to be learned from, from other industries here. Uh, we went up and picked up a pizza and a bottle of wine, and they had a window to order, window, they had a, a tin, you know, still had a sign, it was cashless, but they had a tin for clean pens and a clean for you know, dirty pens. And you know, so it, you know, so there's, 
there's things there that you can put in place and once again implement people and have a safety to it. I think there is also an opportunity for a distribution of hospitality uh, throughout a space. So you're not all converging in one place. Mm. Gotcha. Uh, so decentralize the yeah. the shared things. Yeah. That's, that's you know interesting. I mean, we're actually even looking at, you know, are, are there mobile or semi, you know, sanitation stations that can be distributed across the floor plate. Um, so you, you're not trying to drive traffic to one place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more localized. Gotcha. Um, if you have questions, um, please toss them in the Q&A. Uh, we're going to just do a few more before we wrap at probably the 40, so another two to three minutes. Um, but please, please toss them in. Um, okay. Uh, it, you opened with innovation. You sort of said this is sort of like a major catalyzing event. Um, thinking high level here, like what is the silver lining? Um, is it we get sort of implement all the technologies that we've always wanted to implement and do all the work from home stuff that we've always wanted to do? Or is it like, what, what is it about this moment that is maybe good or, or um, helpful? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's two of them. I, I, I think IT, IT budgets are probably going to be more rapidly approved in the short term. Um, and especially, um, you know, um, any type of technology like this, any video conferencing platforms, how we think about our spaces, um, that even if it's a meeting for eight and there's only four people physically in the space, still think virtually that you're accommodating eight people. And what is the experience for the four people outside the room? And is it equal to the four people that are, in, that are inside the room? Um, I, so I think that's a silver lining. I think also the, the silver lining of flexibility that just giving people the personal license to say, hey, I'm not feeling well today. I'm gonna stay home, but I'm gonna be productive. I can still work from home, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really gonna help keep you safe. And the whole notion of, does this really present an opportunity for a more human-centric design for the office? Uh, so it's actually going to be a better place to go to at the end of this. So at the beginning, you mentioned a checklist uh, that you'd put together, a uh, roundtable. Are there resources if uh, this crew and some of the attendees would like to be able Absolutely. to, where, where can they go to grab those? And also, if, you, if, if they are open, we're happy to circulate as well. Yeah, um, you know, mill.com under resources. Uh, there's a healthy workplace uh, um, um, site that you know, we've got a uh, kind of checklist to return. We've got uh, considerations for um, either you know, panel based, spine based, or, or, or desking. You know, if you want to look at that and make modifications to your exist existing setups or thinking about new ones. Um, there's also, we're looking at the notion of shared spaces and what does that mean for reduced seating, more distance, those types of things. Uh, but you go to null.com resources and you can find those. Um, and then I try to ask this question with everyone that we've talked to. Um, if, like, what is the, and this will be kind of the last one, what is the reality or the thing that people aren't talking about but ought to be considering? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think they should be thinking about what they aspire to. Um, I, you know, I know this is you know, right, right at the moment we're, we're kind of mired in this, uh, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad news out there and, uh, and we're trying to, to sift through it. But, you know, can we take cues from, from some of the healthcare workers that have just been heroic? Um, you know, and can you become your own personal hero? I and mean, what can you do to just, and you know, whatever you do, do it the best that you possibly can. Yeah. yeah. Um, any last sort of thoughts, recommendations, resources, or recommendations you can, you can provide this crew? Um, you know, as I said, we, you know, I think OSHA and CDC are doing some good things for, from a safety standpoint. Uh, if uh, you need anything specific from a workplace standpoint, uh, you know, folks at NOLA are always there for you. Um, we're happy to help. Um, but most importantly, just, um, you know, let's be diligent and let's move forward and make, make the best of a very dire situation, if you will. Yeah. Um, Tracy, thank you so much for spending some time uh, with us. Um, we will share um, all of this with everyone who attended just so that you've got a, uh, you can sort of um, view it asynchronously as you need. And if you have any other questions, um, best place to reach you is email, Twitter, yep. LinkedIn. Uh, um, email or LinkedIn, either one. Okay. Tweimer at null.com. There you go.
Cool. Um, thank you everybody for uh, coming by and um, we'll, we'll send you a note when the next one's happening. Have a great day. Thank you, Andrew.